So I've been working on a new series called Body Language with Seeker, and I am so excited about the amazing response that it has received so far. So many of you have said such kind things about how excited you are that we're making a series like it and how necessary something like this is and I'm very grateful for you. However, there have been many people in the comments who have seemed a little bit upset that we're talking about something like this and insisting that it isn't an issue, that medical bias and bias in science and research is a historical issue and not something that continues to affect our world today. So even though we cover some amazing examples in the video, which you can check out on Seeker's channel, I'm gonna give you five more examples today of ways in which centuries of inequity have led to things that still affect the way female-bodied people and women are treated by medicine these days. This is a speculum. It was invented by James Marion Sims, who is a man often credited as the father of modern gynecology. He's often referred to as the man who was the first explorer of modern gynecological medicine, which he did by forcibly surgically experimenting on slave women without their consent and often without anesthesia. So he was a real a He invented the speculum in the late 1800s and it hasn't changed a whole hell of a lot in the last 200 years. What happens is a doctor inserts the speculum, yes, this freaking thing, into the vagina and literally cranks it open. It gives the doctor a clear view into the patient's vagina and often a clear line of sight into the cervix. So it is very useful and necessary, but it's not very comfortable. These bills can often pinch, like this edge is kind of sharp. The metal is cold and it's just a little unnerving to hear a doctor literally winching your vagina open. Both doctors and patients say they want a better device that would give a better experience. And part of this is down to your doctor and their bedside manner, how they introduce the device to you and your body, making you feel more comfortable. But if we made pelvic exams less scary, both through doctor behavior and through an improved design for a device like the speculum, maybe more people would feel less afraid of getting a pelvic exam and conditions that go undiagnosed, like cervical cancer or vaginal infections, would get caught sooner and result in better health outcomes. This is an IUD. It's a small, long-acting, reversible contraceptive device that gets inserted through the cervix into the uterus. What happens is a doctor will take a speculum, like the one we just talked about, and crank open the vagina, and then take a clamp that holds the cervix in place, which is at the very back of the vagina, and then takes a little hollow tube called a sounder, inserts that through the hole in the cervix, inserts the device through the tube where the arms of the device unfold inside the uterus. The doctor then snips off the two long uh, metal threads that are coming off of the IUD so that they rest just above the cervix. And if you think that sounds like it might be a little bit uncomfortable, that's because it is. Now everyone experiences this process completely differently. Some people say they feel nothing at all. Some people say they feel a slight pinch. Some people say they feel a intense cramp and then it's over. But for some people, it's the most intense pain of their entire life. Some people pass out, some people throw up. Some people say they were not at all prepared in any way for how painful the IUD insertion process was. But the thing is, doctors can offer you anesthesia. They can offer you a numbing cream or a numbing injection into the cervix that would make this process much more tolerable for lots of people. Now, I didn't even actually know that anesthesia was available for the IUD insertion procedure until like this year, and I've had two of them. Granted, the process was not that bad for me, but I had heard horror stories and I've never heard anybody, any of the tens of people who I personally know who've had an IUD inserted, I've never heard any of them say that their practitioner offered them anesthesia, even though it's readily available. And a recent research study shows that this is because healthcare practitioners have been underestimating the level of pain that their patients are experiencing during IUD insertion. Patients report a higher level of pain than the doctor estimates that pain to be. The availability of contraception is incredibly important to health outcomes related to pregnancy, sex, childbirth, all kinds of things. So regardless of how the insertion process ends up being for you personally, you should be presented with all of your choices, no matter what. Now, moving on to a, another subset of medicine, female-bodied people are more likely to be turned away from the emergency room when experiencing a heart attack or a stroke because the symptoms that people are taught in medical school for those conditions are the typically male presenting symptoms. For example, with a heart attack, men are more likely to present with chest pain, neck pain, jaw pain, and radiating arm pain, whereas female-bodied people are more likely to present with sudden dizziness, shortness of breath, and acid reflux-like symptoms, so are more likely to be turned away from the emergency room when they are actively having a heart attack, just because our understanding of the symptoms have been biased by gender. 
Study after study after study has also shown that female pain is also taken much less seriously. Female ER patients wait longer on average for pain management than male patients do, and over 65% of female patients say that they don't feel their practitioner takes their pain seriously when talking to them because of their gender. These study participants reported being treated as if they were hysterical, attention-seeking, or even drug-seeking when they were actually expressing pain that was due to a very real issue like endometriosis, kidney stones, or other internal organ issues that eventually later was revealed to need urgent treatment. Now, lastly, and this is one that is very near and dear to my own heart because it's an issue that does affect me personally, is that women are much more likely to be misdiagnosed, go undiagnosed, or be diagnosed much later in life with two very important issues, and that's ADHD and autism. And that is once again because our presentation of those symptoms is pretty radically different from the commonly understood norm, which is how those disorders appear in male patients. This leads to all kinds of poor mental and physical health outcomes for female body people who may be going undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. We may be given medication that isn't right for what we actually have. We may suffer from depression, anxiety, PTSD because our issue is going untreated. I myself was only diagnosed with ADHD at 27. I've struggled with it my entire life up until now and now that I've finally received treatment for it, my quality of life has improved immensely. And while I could go on and on and on and on and continue this list ad nauseum, I'm gonna stop there. It's really interesting to me that many people who identify as men in the comments of that video and in this series are pushing back so hard against the need for a series like it or against the statement that there is gender bias or racial bias or queer bias in things like medicine and science. I've left a few books down in the comments that are incredible explorations of how this issue has developed over history since the beginning of recorded time up until now and how they still affect our world today. So if you want more details, you can check them out. And subscribe to this channel for more, subscribe to Seeker to catch up with the new series Body Language, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.